guys. So today's episode will be about the mysterious disappearance of Judge Joseph Crater, who was a New York Supreme Court judge, and uh, he mysteriously disappeared one night on August 6, 1930. And it was uh, an extremely famous case, especially in the 30s, but it also became a kind of pop culture reference, um, and the, it, it developed this kind of life of its own um, for several decades after that. At this point, probably many of you haven't heard about this case, but um, it is referred to in a lot of these uh, other books on um, conspiracies and scandals and these kinds of things. Um, because nobody knows what happened to him. So, this particular article is from prairieghosts.com, and I think we're going to look at two other articles, um, if this one doesn't go into every single piece of the story. Okay, so, um, it's called Dead Men Do Tell Tales. Judge Crater vanished. What happened to the missingest man in New York? Perhaps no disappearance in American history has created as much speculation that of New York Supreme Court Associate Justice Joseph F. Grader. For many years, he was known simply as the most missingest man in New York. He was last seen on the evening of August 6, 1930, walking out of a New York restaurant. Grader was a tall, heavyset man and an avowed clothes horse. He was especially dapper that evening as he stepped out of the restaurant, waved goodbye to a couple of friends, and then climbed into a taxi cab. His friends would remember his double-breasted brown suit, gray spats, and high collar for it was the last suit they ever saw him wear. After that final glimpse, Crater was never seen again. But how was it possible for a man as powerful and as prominent as a Supreme Court judge to disappear forever? So, um, I'll see if there are better images of Judge Crater because I, I want to expand this a little bit more. Okay. Judge Crater's career was unquestionably successful. He was born and raised in Easton, Pennsylvania, and later graduated from Lafayette College and the Columbia University Law School in 1913. He began practicing law in New York and got mixed up in local politics. He soon became president of the Democratic Party Club in Manhattan and saw his law practice flourish thanks to his connections to the corrupt Democratic leadership at Tammany Hall. In April 1930, he was appointed to the New York Supreme Court. He had withdrawn $20,000 from the bank just days before his appointment. The sum was close to a year's salary, but was standard Tammany Hall payoff for the lucrative post that he received. It was not a poor investment either. According to investigators who later looked into his role as a receiver of a bankrupt hotel, Crater sold it to bond and mortgage firm for $75,000, and two months later the city agreed to buy it back for a planned street widening for a condemned property price of almost $3 million. Crater did just as well in his private life. In 1916, a woman named Stella Wheeler retained him in a divorce trial, and the next year, right after her divorce became final, Stella married her attorney. By all accounts, they appeared to be happy and a devoted couple. In the summer of 1930, Judge Crater and his wife were vacationing at their summer cabin at Belgrade Lakes in Maine. In late July, he received a telephone call, and he offered no information to his 
Joseph Mara cashed two checks for him that amounted to $5,150. At noon, he and Mara carried two locked briefcases to his apartment, and he let Mara take the rest of the day off. Later that evening, Crater went to a Broadway ticket agency and purchased one seat for a comedy that was playing that night called Dancing Partners at the Velasco Theater. He then went to Billy Haas's Chop House on West 45th Street for dinner. Here he ran into two friends, a fellow attorney and his showgirl date, and he joined them for dinner. The lawyer later told investigators that Crater was in a good mood that evening and gave no indication that anything was bothering him. The dinner ended a little after 9 p.m., a short time after the curtain had opened for the show that Crater had a ticket for, and the small group went outside. As mentioned already, Crater waved goodbye to his friends and then entered a cruising taxi that he hailed down. His next and likely final location remains a mystery. Strangely, there was no immediate reaction to Judge Crater's disappearance. When he did not return to Maine for ten days, his wife began making calls to their friends in New York, asking if anyone might have seen him. Only when he failed to appear for the opening of the courts on August 25th did his fellow justices become alarmed. They started a private search, but failed to find any trace of him. The police were finally notified on September 3rd, and after that, the missing judge was front-page news. The story captivated the nation, and a massive investigation was launched. Had Crater been killed, or had he simply disappeared on his own? That was the question that everyone wanted the answers to. From police detectives to shady business partners to the average man on the street, the official investigations started off with a bang, but quickly slowed down. Detectives discovered that the judge's safe deposit box had been cleaned out, and the two briefcases that Crater had his assistant had taken to his apartment were also missing. They, These promising leads were quickly bogged down by the thousands of false reports that were coming in from people who claimed to have seen the missing man. In October, a grand jury began looking into the case and ended up calling 95 witnesses and amassing 975 pages of testimony. After all that, the conclusion was, the evidence is insufficient to warrant any expression of opinion as to whether Crater is alive or dead, or as to whether he has absented himself voluntarily, or is the sufferer from some disease and the nature of amnesia, or is the victim of a crime. The investigation was at a standstill, and most assumed that the judge had ducked out just one step ahead of someone who was looking for him. For decades after his disappearance, his name was a slang term for dodging one's responsibilities. Uh, the term was to pull a crater, was to slip away permanently. But if the judge did go into hiding with a trunk load of cash, how do we explain what Sally Crater discovered in her apartment on, in January 1931? Hidden in a bureau, she found several uncast checks, stocks, bonds, and three life insurance policies, and a note from Judge Crater himself. The note listed his financial assets and then added, I am very wary. If the judge had simply run off, would he have cashed these checks and have cashed in the stocks? And why would he have made his disappearance seem like a man who is depressed or was carrying it out? Better yet, why would he disappear at all? There have been many theories put forward to answer the mystery of Judge Crater. Mrs. Crater and many of his close friends believed that he was a victim of foul play. Sally Crater stated that he was murdered because of something sinister connected to politics, and she may have been right given his involvement in bribery 
backdoor dealings with Tammany Hall politics and questionable real estate deals. She also did not believe that the judge would have voluntarily vanished. Joe Crater would not run away from anybody that would meet his problems directly, whatever they were. In 1937, Mrs. Crater sued the three insurance companies for double indemnity on her husband's life insurance policies. During the trial, her attorney, Emil K. Ellis, advanced her murder theory, but left politics out of the mix. He claimed that the judge Crater had been blackmailed by a Broadway showgirl and had cashed the checks for 5150 to pay her off. When she demanded more money and Crater refused to pay, a gangster friend of the showgirl had killed him, perhaps accidentally. The attorney's theories did not impress the court, and they denied the double indemnity claims. On June 6, 1939, Judge Crater was officially declared dead, but sightings continued for years, as did the theories as to what happened to him. Possible exits of the judge have included his murderer by political cronies just before he could testify against them in a craft investigation and cover-up of his death in the arms of his mistress or prostitute. Some believe he was killed in a dispute over a payoff or that he decided to drop out and start a new life in Quebec, Europe, or the Caribbean. One thing that is sure is that it's unlikely we'll ever readily know what happened to the missingest man in New York. Okay, so in that particular article, we get a couple of the basics as to what could have possibly happened. And um, this case basically uh, sat, you know, for several decades and it became... Like I said, a uh, pop culture sort of uh, reference here is, here is uh, Judge Joseph Grader, so you can see. I'm just going to scroll down how tall he actually is. He's And he's very dapper. He was all about clothes and, and you know, looking um, fit and, and uh, the best that he possibly could. So... Uh, there are a couple of issues with this particular case that I think caught the national attention once it did become a public story. The first issue was he had a lot of dalliances with um, these showgirls. Now, the person that he was uh, having dinner with, um, her name was Sally Ritz, and she was, Susie Ritz, sorry, and she was a showgirl. They did not, whether they met randomly at that restaurant, I don't think so. Um, he had an apartment in New York, but he also kept a place for her, so she was his, like, uh, girlfriend that, or mistress that he kept on the side in New York. Um, he had been to New York the week prior as well and had been staying at the apartment with her. So, um, they were not just, you know, random friends. And, uh, the other person that he met with at the restaurant with was his lawyer, uh, Mr. Klein. So, prior to that particular, uh, evening, he, um, maybe like three days prior, I guess, he was in Maine with his wife. Um, now his wife's birthday was on the 9th of August and because he had left the week prior and then come back and now he got this weird phone call and uh, she said that he was um, clearly upset by it and he had to go straighten some fellows out. He uh, promised her that he would be back for her birthday which was on the 9th and um, and then he goes to New York for these you know couple of days, withdraws all this money, um, the five thousand dollars in equivalency for today is around seventy five thousand, um, considering the inflation rate, and uh, so that's a lot of money that seems like payoff money. Um, and, but the question is, who is he paying off? Because as far as the Tammany Hall situation was concerned, um, if you guys are not familiar with uh, what was going on with Tammany Hall, these guys uh, used to buy and sell through bribes a lot of uh, political positions. 
decisions. And if you got in mixed in with this particular group, you could basically buy your seat in different positions. Um, in his previous positions, did seem to buy a lot of, or, or did seem to just suddenly miraculously get these amazing uh, positions from a, a rather lowly state of being a clerk, um, suddenly being able to pay for law school, and then having all of these various political connections along the way. It, um, people became suspicious of, of this uh, rise to power as well as how many people he knew uh, that he could pull favors for. So it seems like he was a guy that was a connected guy from the early, you know, the onset of his career and that he was someone that was getting placed in certain positions uh, because it would benefit various people within the political arenas or whoever he was representing because eventually he started to represent a lot of the people within the Democratic Party associated with Tammany Hall and he had this thriving law practice. Um, so he was benefiting and he was like their inside guy. They could sort of trust him. He was also brokering a lot of deals, um, a lot of real estate deals where he would have access to condemned properties, sell them for pennies, and then resell them to the city for millions. And this thing was apparently going on pretty consistently. Now people became very suspicious about the $20,000 that he pulled up because $20,000 um, and uh, considering inflation comes to something like $300,000 in our uh, in modern day, which is a lot of money, but apparently that was the standard for buying a seat. Um, so it, it, it was a tremendous amount of money though, especially at that time. And um, the Tammany Hall people already had somebody who was uh, set for taking this particular judgeship spot. They got paid this $20,000, it seems, because nobody was able to find out where the money went. He pulled the money. And, uh, and then, you know, nobody knows what happened, so they're assuming it's a bribe. Uh, and then the, the person that was supposed to get that position didn't, and he got it. So people were suspicious right from the beginning, but he only had that position for, like, I think four months. Um, and he was involved with all kinds of deals within that short period of time, involving the mob and involving uh, the government and scamming the government and just doing all kinds of crazy things, as well as getting a lot of different politicians in and out of uh, politically dangerous situations and um, helping to cover up a lot of things, too. There were a lot of situations with showgirls and, uh, you know, socialites and different people, and he was involved with all. He was, like, right in the mix of it. So he was in a, in a sort of hot seat in this particular position, but he wielded a lot of power as well. So, um, for him to go, uh, from, you know, leave his vacation, not really tell his wife where he's going, come back to New York, and then pull $5,000, as well as, uh, burn, uh, take all of these papers out of his office, um, something is suspicious about that. Now, why would you do something like that? Why would you take papers out of your office? The assumption is you don't want anyone else to see those papers if they um, then, you know, eventually have access, meaning that you're not going to be there uh, or somebody has requested that you remove those papers from, from the office. So it's one or the other. Um, it could be that he had planned on disappearing and so he didn't want certain documents left there. But then the question is, would $5,000 be enough money for him to live on for a period of time, especially since he had pulled a much larger sum previous to that? So uh, I'm not really sure 
something else came to light in 2005, so I'm going to go to that article now. Okay, so this is from Fox News, and it says, Judge Crater's disappearance is possibly solved. The New York City Police Department's longest-running unsolved missing persons case, the bizarre and legendary disappearance of Judge Joseph Force Crater, may finally have been solved. Judge Crater, who vanished mysteriously 75 years ago, was killed by a city cop and his cab driver brother and buried under the boardwalk in Coney Island, according to a handwritten letter left behind by a Queens woman who died earlier this year. Good Time Joe Crater was a dapper 41-year-old judge known for his dalliances with showgirls and his ties to corruption, uh, written at Tammany Hall, until he got into a cab in Midtown Manhattan one evening in 1930 and disappeared, earning the title of the missingest man in New York. The case triggered one of the most sensational manhunts of the 20th century, one that had city detectives fielding more than 16,000 tips from around the country and the world, all of them unsubstantiated. Although he was declared legally dead in 1939, and his case, missing persons file number 13595, was officially closed in 1979, Crater's Vanishing Act has continued to intrigue professional and armchair detective clairvoyants and mystery buffs around the globe. Pulling a crater became slang for vanishing without a trace, but perhaps now a trace will be found. Sources told the Post that the New York City Police Department Cold Case Squad is investigating information provided by Stella Ferrucci Gold of Bella Rose, Queens, who died on April 2nd, leaving behind what may be a key to the mystery. It's a handwritten letter in an envelope marked, Do Not Open Until My Death, that her granddaughter, Barbara O'Brien, found in a metal box in her grandmother's home. And the sources said in the letter, Ferrucci Good claimed that her late husband, Robert Good, a New York City Police Department cop named Charles Burns, and the cop's cabbie brother, Frank Burns, were responsible for Crater's death. She added that the judge was buried in Coney Island, Brooklyn, under the boardwalk near West 8th Street at the current site of the New York Aquarium. The metal box also contained yellowed clippings about Crater's disappearance with scribbled notations in the margins. In her letter, Ferrucci Good also claimed that Officer Burns was one of the cops guarding notorious murder and killer Abe Kid Twist reels when he somehow plummeted to his death from the sixth floor window of a Coney Island hotel in 1941. Riles had become a mob informant to escape the electric chair testifying against a slew of murder and killers. His suspicious death plunged name came just hours before he was due to rat out mob boss Albert Anastasia. O'Brien's father, William St. George, said the police told family members that five bodies were found when the aquarium was built. Police sources confirmed that skeletal remains had been found there in the mid-1950s. They said that those remains are now being examined to see if they can be linked to Crater. Police sources also confirmed that a police officer named Charles Burns did serve with the NYPD from 1926 to 1946 and that he spent part of his career assigned to the 60th Precinct in Coney Island. O'Brien, who lives in Valley Stream, New York, doesn't know what to make of the letter and its claims. When she found it, she said, I thought it was a joke, and I laughed, and I gave it to the police. I don't know if it's fact or fiction, she said, refusing to show the post, the letter, or to say anything more about it. But the police were very interested in it, her father noted, asked if Ferrucci Good had been obsessed with a greater case, St. George said that he couldn't recall her ever mentioning it. Ferrucci Good was 91 when she died in April, and her brother Robert Good, a park.
Parks Department supervisor and lifeguard died in 1975. Grader had been appointed to the state Supreme Court bench by then, and Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt just four months before disappearing oh, by uh, by uh, Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt just four months before disappearing on August 6. A few days earlier, while vacationing with his wife Stella at their summer cabin in Belgrade Lakes, Maine, he received a mysterious phone call that left him visibly upset. He never told his wife who called, and he left the next day for the city, telling her only that he had to straighten those fellows out. He stopped by their Fifth Avenue apartment and gave the maid a few days off. He spent the morning of August 6th in his courthouse office, hastily going through personal files. He cashed two checks totaling $5,150 and took another twenty. 20000 close to a year's salary from campaign funds and left her for home with two locked briefcases. He had last been seen at 9.15 p.m. leaving Billy Oz's job house at 332 West 45th Street with two friends. He said he was going to the theater. He climbed into a cab, Natalie dressed in a brown pinstripe suit, grape spats, and a straw Panama hat, and that was the last anyone had ever seen of him. Could the cabbie have been Frank Burns, his brother of Officer Charles Burns? That was a question the cops are now grappling with. It was four weeks before Crater was reported missing. Friends and colleagues thought he was vacationing with his wife, and his wife thought he was away on business. His disappearance was French page news across the country, leading to reported sightings in every state and scores of foreign lands. He was reported seen riding a burrow and prospecting for gold in California, herding sheep in the Pacific Northwest, locked up in a Missouri mental hospital, shooting crabs in Atlanta, working on a steamer in the Adriatic, and running a bingo game in North Africa. His name became a punchline that guaranteed laughs for come comics. Judge Crater, call your office, they would say. Mad Magazine published a cartoon showing Lassie finding Crater. A judge portrayed on TV in an episode of the Dick Van Dyke show assured the sitcom stars that he wasn't that Judge Crater. He spelled his name K-R-A-D-A. There were dozens of theories about his disappearance. He had amnesia. He committed suicide. He ran off with a showgirl. He was rubbed out so he couldn't testify about Tammany Hall corruption. He died in the arms of a prostitute, and it was being covered up. He was killed when he didn't pay a blackmailer. At one point, gangster Jack's Jack Legs Diamond's name surfaced as his possible killer. An Albany professor said that he believed Crater had been dispatched by the notorious murderer in the basement of an upstate brewery. Crater's wife remembered his disappearance every year for the rest of her life by visiting a bar in Greenwich Village on August 6th. She'd sit by herself, order two drinks, and down one, saying, Good luck, Joe, wherever you are. If the letter left behind by Ferrucci Good is right, he's been sleeping with the fishes all these years. So that was the um, article from Fox News. And it does seem like it's possible that um, this woman's uh, handwritten note has a little bit of substantiation because they did find that there was an officer by the names of by the name of Burns, um, and he did have a brother who was a taxi driver, and he was working the Coney Island area precinct uh, during the years that this occurred. So um, the fact that she, you know, linked this uh, in her letter, and it turns out that these people did exist, uh, it's very possible, and the last two witnesses, his girlfriend, uh, Susie Ritz, and the lawyer, the last thing they saw was that he got into a cab. Um, the little, the little caveat to this was that, um, Susie Ritz said in her, um, uh, interview that she gave, she has a little bit of an interesting side story too, but anyway, uh, Susie Ritz said that he was planning on walking to the theater to see the show that he had tickets for. Um, and 
uh, she was surprised when he stopped. You know, so he's left the restaurant there waving him off. He walks a little bit and then stops a cab. He basically um, comes up to his, uh, you know, comes up to where he's at. He stops and talks for a second to the cabbie and then gets in. She even thought that was weird because he did not hail the cabbie. And uh, so she mentions this as just a side note that we just assumed because he was at some distance that he decided not to walk. And she just thought, you know, from her own thinking that it was because he had these new shoes on, these uh, gray spats that he was wearing and that he might, maybe didn't want to get them dirty. That was just her idea. But if you think about it, he's, all, you know, told them that he's going to walk to the theater he probably would have walked to the theater. Nobody really, um, if you're not going to hail, you either hail a cab yourself if that's what you want to do. But this cab stopped him. That, I think, is suspicious. I think that that was the um, brother of Burns, the officer, and I think that he was told to stop him. I think he was told, uh, you know, where he was going to be or maybe he had been following him. And, um, you know, he was told to stop and then, you know, told him that whoever he was supposed to have this meeting with, um, that they want to meet at Coney Island or wherever, and that he was assigned to take him there. So he gets in. I think that that's probably what happened. Now, the weird part about it is, um, the tickets that he had bought for the theater that night were actually used. Uh, but the witnesses at the theater said that it wasn't him that attended the play. Uh, so that's another strange story. So either he made up the story about the play because uh, it's possible that he just said that to those two, that that's where he was going to go, was going to go and see play. Um, tickets had been purchased. Uh, I don't know if they were purchased through his office. Like, how did they even know? Or was he just telling people that he was at purchase tickets, but everyone at the theater said that it wasn't him, so either somebody just randomly took his seat, you know, because the play had already started when he was leaving the um, job house, so it wasn't like a major priority for him to actually go and see the show, and it's possible that he was just picking up another showgirl, because he had this, um, you know, relationship going on with these showgirls, several of them actually, so uh, it's unclear what that deal was, but then who, did somebody take his ticket or get his ticket, or what What was that about? I, I, I thought that was a little strange, that his ticket was used for that night, um, so he must have given it to somebody, maybe gave it to his clerk, you know, it, it's a, a strange little side store part of it, but anyway, um, I do think that he got into the cab with Burns, and that just the way that that cab story kind of, uh, was explained by the Susie Ritz, that she said he's, he was going to walk there, and then she was surprised when he stopped and started talking to a cab who, you know, had just come and sort of slid up next to him, um, and so that was kind of strange. Now everyone became even more suspicious of this case because Susie Ritz then disappeared. Uh, you know, nobody could find her for like 75 years. Everyone thought she had been um, another missing person. She she wasn't. She was actually, she just left. She left the business and, and uh, moved to California, changed her name. So she was scared, I guess, probably by this greater situation and um, didn't do any interviews after that point and just was, you know, very cautious and never talked about it until um, she was a much older person. And uh, at that point, she didn't have anything to add to this particular story. Um, but, you know, it, it just added to the conspiracy at the time because nobody knew where she had gone. And she was one, she was literally like the last person who had seen him alive. Uh, and, and the other part of this story that I find kind of strange is how long it took for this actually to become a police case. Because like I said, his wife expected him back before the 9th when he doesn't show up. Um, why does it take her, like, I think, I don't know, uh, it took her uh, by the 16th of August to start asking around.
around for him. It's possible that she just thought he was on business and, you know, couldn't get back to her. But a phone call or something like that probably would have been expected that, you know, to get a, at least a call on her birthday since he had made these uh, promises, apparently, that he would be back by then. So that was a little strange that she didn't call. And then the other strange part is um, the his people at work didn't call either. Nobody was calling the police. They were doing their own little investigations, which is a little bizarre. I, and they were also not telling her what they were finding out. So I think behind the scenes, everyone who knew him knew what he was involved with. And with a little bit of effort, realized that uh, something had happened to him. And the, if the police themselves were involved, it would make sense that they would not, you know, there would be no need to contact the police department if uh, one of their own members had actually been a part of this, um, you know, situation. So it seemed like everybody kind of knew because for it to take like a month for them to declare him missing is pretty suspicious. You would think that, you know, it would happen a lot faster than that. Uh, but it, it didn't. The other part that I think is kind of suspicious is how quickly once it did become a national story, how quickly um, it became a uh, media sensation that people were not like upset about it they were making fun of it it's that it became like a national joke um that i think is also a little suspicious too because it's a that a case like this was not really seen as a tragedy but rather was seen as a sort of public joke and this sometimes happens when there is a behind the scenes push to um kind of make a case for people who are already in the know that uh, this is a an example of what can happen when you cross whoever it was that was crossed. So whether it was the mob, whether it was um, some sort of a shady business deal, it's possible that it was a Tammany Hall thing, even though I think he had paid those guys off and he was one of their main lawyers for so many years. So I, I don't know if it was them, but then again, he did take papers, um, meaning that it was something to do with his law practice. And since he was their lawyer, I, it's possible that it was them. And, I mean, well, you know, there's just so many possibilities, but I do think that uh, this Ferrucci Gold my, probably was telling the truth. I don't have any reason to think that she wasn't. She was did not, as far as her family was concerned, um, was not uh, obsessed with the case. It never mentioned it or anything, but it was sort of a secret that she had kept, and she uh, wanted to make sure that it was only revealed after she passed, so she was scared about the information coming out. Um, some of her information checks out, at least with the police officer and the taxi cab uh, driver, and the fact that when they did, ex they did exhume bodies from underneath the boardwalk um, where the aquarium was built. So even the location, bodies were removed so that it was, I guess, a common burial ground in the 30s uh, before the aquarium was up to, you know, um, what, I don't know if there was a boardwalk there or what, but to, I guess, uh, they could easily cement over anything that they dug up. They could just put pour cement over it and nobody would find it. Um, so it's because there were five bodies found. So I'm thinking this was a common site that uh, they used this, you know, whether this crooked cop was a part of the mob or whatever, whatever group he was involved with. Um, so I think that that's probably, I think it's accurate. I think that's probably what happened to him. He, you know, I don't think he ran away the way that some people think, even though the amount of money that he's pulling does seem like runaway money, 20000 and 5000 and removing papers. Um, but again, it could also be payout money. So it, there are a number of possibilities as to what, possibly happen, but I think the Ferrucci Gold's letter does, it's probably, you know, 
know something that checked out now she now the other weird thing about this though is that she that letter came out in 2005 um the police department had it at that time right so you know it's been enough time for them to do a dna test to test if that is um uh, judge greater or not or you know i don't know if he had any children or uh if there's any way to what you know something to test against if he has living family members but uh you know it's it's been more than enough, enough time but if the, if it would then corroborate her story that it was a cop that did it as well as um his brother then that might be the reason that they're not pursuing this at any great speed. Um, it could be that they don't have enough, you know, evidence as far as like the, um, you know, bone fragments. But I, I don't know. I just have a feeling that they probably is greater with amongst those different bodies that were found. And uh, they know it is, but they don't want to corroborate her story completely because then it would mean one of their own officers even though several decades ago was involved with this it would just look bad in general um you know so i think it's possible that they're just staying quiet because this is enough time for them to at least have said you know yes or no that uh, those remains any of them might have belonged to greater so any i i think that he's probably was buried there uh, and that's probably what happened to him so anyway this was the i, I don't know if we have the picture in this um no not on this one um of uh, judge joseph greater and the most missingest man in new york i think that he uh you know was put to rest in coney island and for what reason who knows what he was really involved with it seems like it was some sort of a, a crooked dealing where he either owed money or something of that nature there was one other piece of information um he had a uh you know all of his paperwork his um documents that were like his insurance claims as well as a list of people who owed him money in an envelope that was uh you know in the bureau inside the new york apartment that was also shared by his wife and it also had some money in it had like a couple of thousand dollars in it um so that's another part of this where i don't really know where to put that it it sort of makes it seem like you know on one hand he wanted to make sure that she was taken care of he either knew he was up to something very dangerous or um i don't know i mean that almost adds to the disappearance theory that he was trying to make sure that she was okay and that he was sort of setting something up for her but uh i i i think probably he might have had the plan of disappearing it's possible that he thought he would be able to um and he maybe thought he could talk his way out of the situation with money and i think he just wasn't able to because whatever he had gotten involved with had gone too far that the hit was already called on him uh and i do think this officer burns and, and the brother were probably involved just because of the weird way that the taxi cab pulled up to him it wasn't a hailed cab so it just seems like the cab had been following or waiting for him and this was all a planned thing okay so that's my opinion anyway um i hope you guys have a great night and i'll talk to you again